interesting little cover. Uh, first, I'll go over about how I got here, how I ended up at Drift, because I'm not a bioinformatician, um, and and I'm doing a lot of engineering for bioinformaticians, so it's a, a, a little interesting. Uh, I want to go over sort of like what genomics isn't. Um, a lot of genomics and bioinformatics. Um, uh, there's a lot of sort of um, um, I call it like the CSI effect uh, uh, around what people think DNA does. Um, so we'll go into a little bit of science. We'll, we'll talk about DNA a bit and, and how genomes work. Um, and as we get into that, that science, we'll end up getting, we'll end up realizing that biology is actually pretty difficult. You know, the, the, the complex systems that make up our, our living beings actually are, are pretty hard to understand. Um, and, uh, you know, the tools that we use to understand the bioinformatics, um, that as a field can be a challenging field to work in as well. And um, uh, for, for a little fun, we'll, we'll play with a little bit of dynamite uh, to go over a, a, a typical problem uh, or a, a sample problem that happens in, in bioinformatics. And then to top it all off, you know, if the science wasn't hard enough and then the ability to understand the science wasn't hard enough, you know, you've got to put these on computers and run them at scale, and guess what? That's pretty tough, too, sometimes. Uh, and, of course, it ends up that Airflow can help with a lot of these problems. And, and uh, you know, um, these, these challenges I want to just lay out right at the beginning aren't unique to bioinformatics or genomics. Um, you'll notice a lot of similar um, uh, pain points in any form of hard science or hard computational science. There, there are a lot of the same patterns that are repeated that, um, you know, could be applied to, say, computational chemistry or, um, uh, you know, population monitoring or any other sort of like uh, statistical uh, modeling techniques. So uh, speaking of computational chemistry, uh, that's kind of how I got my start. This is a really old photo. It's from like 20 years ago. Um, uh, I wanted to be a chemist. And uh, in undergrad, I was lucky enough to be working with a physical chemistry group and got to build a cluster. Uh, so this was back in 2002, 2003. Um, so we're talking about Beowulf clusters, you know, really, really old school clusters. Uh, and from there, I realized I didn't really want to be a chemist. I wanted to be I wanted to be working with computers and 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 you know large systems at scale. Uh, so I actually ended up working in man the manufacturing industry for a number of years um, and got exposed to a lot of like lean, agile uh, um, techniques, mostly Toyota production systems. I worked in automotive. Um, I I'm originally from Michigan. I was in LA for about a decade, and I just moved back to Michigan. So. Um, automotive is a really big background that I have, and that carried over into doing consulting for a number of large firms on their sort of uh, corporate social resp responsibility. So this ended up me, that's how I kind of ended up getting into to web tech from like industrial management. And then I've ended up working for a uh, variety of startups, um, really gotten into Kubernetes and, and container orchestration, which takes me all the way back to that picture of me in 2003 with my little research group and our cluster named Ernst. Um, you know, I, everything seems to be circular. And here I am back at doing um, work with clusters and distributed systems. Uh, so what, what's happened in the last decade is there's been just a, a real explosion of genomic data that's been created. Uh, and, and that's because the cost of sequencing DNA has gone down significantly. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we kind of go into the, the biology and the, the science behind this stuff. Uh, and then, of course, this little thing called COVID-19 hit. Um, I don't know if anybody's been affected by it, but it really kind of put the pressure on, hey, we you know, need genomic surveillance and tracking. Um, there's a ton of really interesting engineering challenges uh, that come out of this bioinformatics space that were really appealing to me, and there's a lot of really neat science and math to learn. And I'm, I'm a big science and math buff, so it's it's fun. Um, so let's talk about what genomics is. Uh, and like I said, this is kind of the CSI effect. People think that you get like a bunch of DNA. There's some weird bioinformatics algorithm that gets run, similar to like the CSI enhance on an image. 
And then at the end, it tells you exactly what organism that DNA came from, um, or you know what what the DNA is supposed to be doing in an organism. You know, making it a turtle, or Dana Carvey dressed as a turtle, or maybe it's Salmonella, which is quite frequently found on turtles. Um, so it's a pretty complicated process that starts out with understanding what a genome is. And a genome really just refers to all of the genetic information that's inside of an organism. And there's multiple sources of this. So, you know, you can find DNA in mitochondria, uh, in, um, you know, like animals, humans, in chloroplasts, in a lot of plants. Uh, plasmids are these um, like free floating loops of DNA that are, uh, you know, not contained in a nucleus inside of a bacteria. And then, of course, on chromosomes, um, you know, these are all things that, you know, contribute uh, genetic information that help to make an organism what it is. Uh, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about today, actually, all I'm going to talk about is, is just DNA. Um, uh, RNA comes in primarily when you're dealing with um, viruses and also when you start getting into what's known as transcriptomics. So uh, let's talk about the size of genomes. So the, the collective information, you know, in terms of uh, a genome by an organism, let's look at, at scale. Uh, we count, um, we count uh, the size of a genome by the number of base pairs. The nice thing about DNA is you get the reverse complement. So A is only binding to T's, C is only binding to G's. Um, so we count the number of base pairs, and that's how we determine genome size. So uh, COVID it is a virus. It has about 30 kilobase pairs, so 30,000 bases for its entire genome. And most viruses and bacteria are, again, in the 2K to 1 megabase pair range. Uh, more complex bacteria and archaea, these are uh, more complex single cell organisms. You know, you're between uh, half megabase pair and, you know, in the low tens of megabase pairs. Um, that is not a human, that's a mushroom, and it is 44 megabase pairs. Uh, and then a human's 6.4 gig, and then really complex animals like salamanders actually have uh, a, a genome size that we're not really sure about. They're, you know, anywhere between 6 and 20 times the size of a human. There's just so much information contained in their genomes. How we get these genomes uh, are through uh, genome sequencers. So um, there's been multiple generations of genome sequence technology, ge sequencing technology. Uh, the first gen was really pushed by the Human, Gen Human Genome Project, uh, which you know originated in the 90s. Um, and as time has progressed, new forms of uh, sequencing technology have been developed, which have driven down uh, the cost of sequencing considerably. So uh, to give you an example, 2009, Illumina, one of the big uh, players in the genome sequence space, uh, announced that they could do um, whole genome coverage, I think of 30x for a human for 48k, for about 50 grand. Um, and then within two years, they were quoting 5,000. Uh, and then today, it's about 300 bucks to get uh, uh, a whole gen uh, human genome sequenced. So the cost has gone down significantly and um, probably will continue to come down significantly. The device that's on the bottom here is what's known as an Oxford nanopore. Um, and this is one of those new next generation sequencers. Um, it's essentially just a little flow cell. The sequencer itself costs about 1,000 bucks and then it's $100 per sequence that you run. Um, so as long as you can do the chemistry to get your you know, DNA isolated and feed it into this flow cell, you can get um, sequence data. Now, these all work using chemistry, and they use different chemistries. So as a result, what ends up happening is, is the length, the average length of sequences that you get out of it is different. That's your read length. Um, the number of times you have uh, uh, sequence sequence data above a certain position in a genome, that's called your read coverage, and then error rates. 
So um, to give you an example, Illumina machines are, are, are a type of short read sequencer. Um, so their read lengths are pretty small. They're on their range of about, I don't know, 60 to 100 base pairs, uh, depending on how you set it up. You can actually get longer than that. Um, it also has a different error model than, say, a nanopore. A nanopore you know, will pull out you know, a few hundred to a thousand base pairs in a read, but it'll have a different error distribution on those, on those bases, because again, we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about an analog process. And even if you have all the DNA, you really don't have the source code of an organism in, in a way that we like to think about like source code as engineers. Um, what really happens, and, and this is a massive oversimplification of, of how we take uh, A, T, C, and G and turn it into, and, and I'm only talking about proteins, you know, proteins into phenotypes, like actual expressions of a gene, like, you know, I've got uh, reddish brown hair. So uh, we start with DNA, that gets transferred into mRNA, uh, which you may recognize that acronym um, from the COVID vaccines. Uh, messenger RNA uh, is basically a sequence of uh, base pairs that when fed through some ribosomes will create amino acids. So there's like a, a coding table of, um, you know, three bases corresponds to a particular amino acid. And then we have a catalyzation process that happens that will actually fold the amino acids into a particular structure it's protein folding, and that's actually spits out a protein at the end. Um, so, you know, all throughout this entire process, there, there's multiple compilations and modifications and chances for error to be introduced uh, and other sort of like biological mechanisms that sort of uh, uh, control the rate of expression of these uh, um, larger structures, you know, like the proteins and the phenotypical stuff. So the, the scale of genotype to phenotype, it's, it's, it's a pretty big gap from going from A, T, C, and G to, um, you know, this guy's got red hair. So again, as I mentioned, the sequencers punch out different lengths and error distributions. So at the top, I've actually got a, a little bit of a um, sample of a, this is E. coli run through an aluminum machine. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of, G's and C's and T's and stuff. And then underneath of it, we have a bunch of F's and some other ASCII characters. Um, what happens is when you get a read, you get not only your base pairs, you also get what's called a FRED score, quality score. And this is basically uh, the sequencer saying, this is my confidence in that this base is actually that value. Um, down at the bottom, I know you guys can't really see it that well, uh, here is a nanopore read. So this is just the genome information right here, the A's, T's, and C's, and G's. And then the um, error information. The error distribution is much larger on a nanopore machine or uh, some of these long read machines, um, as opposed to, you know, the error is pretty consistent. It's just F um, throughout here. And, and they use hexadecimal characters that get changed to a little, like, proportional scale. Um, so, uh, this is sort of like the difficulties around biology and reads. There's a lot of different types out there, a lot of different errors. So a little bit of zoom in on both those. Now, so we've got a bunch of DNA out of a sequencer. Uh, they may be of different read lengths, read error values, you know, so there's some, you know, complexity going on here. What we have are short substrings of the entire DNA genome. We need to assemble those into the actual genome to be, be able to figure out what this bug does. Uh, and uh, bioinformaticians really like to use uh, analogies. And this is one of their favorite ones for the genome assembly process of, let's take a stack of say a thousand newspapers, stick it on a pile of dynamite, blow it up. Uh, and then from the pieces that are left over, try to reconstruct um, that newspaper. That is pretty much what you do uh, when you start with sequence read information. You gotta do an assembly. Um, there's a ton of different methods for doing assembly. 
Uh, de novo means you just have sequence information and you're going to try to figure out how this bug should be assembled or uh, DNA geno genome should be assembled um, based on internal clues that you have. Uh, or you can do a guided uh, assembly where you know that uh, it's some form of salmonella. Uh, you can use reference genomes to help scaffold out that sort of reconstruction process. Um, then within the de novo versus guided, you also have things like overlap consensus methods, string graph methods, de Bruyne graph methods, um, at various levels of correctness. So uh, the reason I say that is there's a trade-off between um, speed, accuracy, and resource utilization for a lot of these assemblers. And depending on what you want to use your genome data for, you may not necessarily need the best assembly. Um, then again, depending on what you're using your genome for, you may actually need the best assembly. So there's a ton of different tools that can, you know, give you sort of a newspaper at the end of it. Uh, and they all have different requirements. They all have different computational workloads. Some of them are very memory dependent. Some of them are compute dependent. Um, and a lot of the times you end up just like throwing these together with some other tools to create uh, pipelines or ensemble pipelines for assembly methods. So we've got a variety of the input data that we get from sequencers, uh, short versus long. Uh, we've got a variety in, a, in techniques of manipulating this data um, depending on use case. And as I mentioned, a lot of these algorithms are very, you know, they have a variety of uh, compute envelopes. Some of these are, you know, specifically bound to either CPU memory or, or disk space. Um, some of these methods are stupidly parallelizable, like you can just, you know, spin up a hundred nodes and evenly distribute a job across them, and it'll give you a 99.98x speed up in, in computation. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about bioinformatics tools is a lot of the times they came, they come from bioinformaticians, which are mostly academic and industry folks. Um, so the tools themselves aren't really kind of designed with modern application development uh, in mind. So you'll see a lot of Perl. You'll see a lot of really outdated. Um, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, libraries that rely on older compilers, um, you know, very weird voodoo-y environments um, sometimes. Uh, you'll run into fun things like, um, you know, 2000 line bash scripts that define an entire pipeline. Um, going on, the execution environments also that are supported by these tools vary. Um, again, we're, we're targeting mostly typical HPC clusters. So, you know, PBS, Torx, Slurm, CWL. Uh, there, there's all these different ways of defining your workflows and sharing your workflows. Um, you know, there's replicating or building and systematizing uh, bioinformatic workflows gets complicated because of these factors. And this is where Airflow helps. Uh, the first thing that we've found is that uh, Airflow's, you know, native support for uh, Kubernetes makes integrating these like really um, not production systems into a, a pipeline pretty easily. Um, we can control and, and, and maintain our images for our, our Kubernetes pod operators um, and modify the tools to make sure that they work exactly, creating reproducible environments that are scalable extremely easily. Um, this also has the benefit of taking the, you know, that there is actually, I was just looking at a 2000 line bash script <laughs> that was all over the place in terms of how it was like designing a pipeline, taking something like that that's not maintainable and putting it into a simple airflow pipeline uh, makes readability, repeatability, you know, designing experiments so much easier. Uh, airflow also helps out in a big way um, with those compute environments. Um, basically, we extend Airflow's operators quite a bit for our different grid computing environments. We also uh, have support for various different work workflow definition languages. Um, and 
you know, a lot of that is actually open source. We don't actually have to develop it. There are, are adapters that are out there we can grab and use for the workflow definition languages. For grid computing environments, creating the, envi uh, the operators, it's a little more work, but, um, you know, there's great guides out there. Uh, if you're looking to create your own sort of like grid computing operator, I would take a look at the Ray operator um, that uh, astronomers worked on. It's a great reference for understanding how to pass connections to externally manage um, grid computing resources. Uh, another way that we use um, Airflow in managing these pipelines, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in uh, cloud genomics, is the output from those assemblers and those assembler pipelines. Sometimes it's more than just one. Uh, um, assembly that you get out of it. Uh, because it's a pipeline, it might have intermediate assembly graphs that were produced. And when I say an assembly graph, I mean an actual graph. What you get out of an assembler is a bunch of nodes and edges describing sequences, sequence data and how it thinks it's all routed and connected together. Um, using custom XCOM operators, we're able to actually serialize and deserialize uh, uh, to like common graph computation environments. Um, so we can do, we can automate and standardize our sort of like validation and verification tools um, when we're doing genome assemblies. Uh, and of course, that is something that can be extended across a large number of um, bioinformatics and genomics workloads, including, you know, things like annotation or um, gene detection. So Airflow, it's uh, you know great for sort of taking a non um, professionally engineered you know non production environment and making it a production environment relatively simply. Um, it really smooths over a lot of the com complexities and, and uh, difficulties that you encounter in in bioinformatics and genomics, and uh, it's greatly you know increased our throughput and uh, ability to um, produce and. Love it. So with that, um, I'll open it up to any q and I kept it pretty broad. So if you want to deep dive into anything, I'd be glad to talk about it. Thank you so much, uh, Eli. So if anyone has a question, you can uh, put it on the, on the chat or also just um, Turn on your micro and, and ask Eli. Um, anyways, this video will be uploaded in the Apache Airflow YouTube channel. So if you want to. Um, I have a question. Sure. There's a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, first of all. I just, um, a question that I had, and it's more on the Airflow side than. The bioinformatics side is like, have y'all have y'all considered or put time into you into building custom operators to do this modeling for you? So that way you're just passing in different configurations, or or do you just pretty much use a Python operator for most of it? I mean, it's a mix. Uh, so you know, uh, to give you kind of like a rough idea of like how we take, say, that two thousand line bash script that you know is calling a bunch of tools and is really brittle you know we would essentially break that up initially into the individual tools that are being called into their own kubernetes pod operators uh and then work out the sort of um uh the dag graph the the graph of how data should flow between those operators those pods um and then typically if there is something that we find that we want to productionize in a real way, yes, we'll create custom operators for it. That's awesome. Cool. Um, and, and you know, for me, I'll, I'll just say this. I'm not a Python first dev. Uh, it's not you know, like my primary language that I work in for backend systems. I really like Erlang. I really like Elixir. I really like functional languages. and. Um, you know, Airflow really does allow us to. It, it, it's it's easy, easy enough that I can I can write the the right Python for it. 
Um, in terms of the operator that was recommended, uh, in terms of a guide for like creating your own grid computing operator, I would recommend the Ray operator. Um, there is a release of it. I think Astronomer has it. So this is a really good blog post from from uh, Astronomer about Airflow and Ray. Um, I think full disclosure, we actually use Astronomer for our, our managed Airflow instances. But um, yeah, Ray is a really nice Python-based like machine learning cluster framework, which our data scientists really like. So um, you know, using the Ray operator and this sort of a uh, um, guide uh, is a good way to understand how to build your own custom grid compute operators.